What's happening, Planet X? Gavin Fleming here, chilling this week at the Inn at Sunset Cliffs with Chris Aarons, longtime surf journalist. Let's go ahead and check him out. Only here, 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 What's happening to Planet X? Gavin chilling here this week with Chris Aaron. Thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gavin. So everybody knows Chris from his surf journalism. He's done multiple books. If you know the surfing industry, you know Chris. Chris, I want to know how you got into it. What started it all? Hit me from the home base. Well, Gavin, it started when I was, I learned to tell stories, that is, when I was about 13 years old. I grew up in a little crappy little town called Montebello and which is a great reason to travel <laughs> and we would hitchhike to Huntington Beach nice. and hitchhike. we'd get I'd get down to Huntington and come home and then Monday morning people would go oh, how was the surf and I would say um, it was 10 foot I tried to sh I, I'd say it was 10 foot and I shot the pier <laughs> yeah. and people would go you don't even know how to surf you didn't shoot the pier and I went <laughs> so the next time I'd say it was two feet and nobody cared no. so I learned to say things like it was six feet, I borrowed a guy's board, I broke his board trying to shoot the pier, and the guy chased me out of the water. Now that's a good story. More authentic. More authentic, <laughs> it's believable. But so with me, learning to write surf stories was just learning how to lie convincingly, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so surf journalism, what, what year was this? That would have been... 1962. And do you remember your first uh, first piece? The first story that I wrote was uh, that was published was for Surfer Magazine. It came out in 1973. Actually, before that was Surfing World. And then I, I'd worked for well, going back. I worked for Tracks in Australia. Cool. I was broke. I had a camera. I wanted to be a surf photographer. I had a camera. Camera got stolen. <laughs> of course. And I had just enough money to get a little pad and a pencil and I hand wrote some things that I sent to tracks and they published it and I nice. went I'm a writer, I'm a writer. <laughs> here's fifty dollars I can sleep on the beach for a month on fifty dollars <laughs> nice. that's a life that's awesome oh, it was a wonderful life and um, but it also it gave me access to the mainstream the people that I wanted to know I wanted to know about Nat Young and Midget Fairley and George Greeno Greg Knoll, these people who were heroes to me, and I was never invited to their parties. I wasn't part of their group. They were that was an elite oh, yeah. fleet, yeah. and those guys did things that we only dreamed about, and we tried to imitate poorly. <laughs> but now, now I'm part of the party. Now I'm, I guess, kind of like a roadie at least, you know. But it was, <laughs> <laughs> but it was an access to the mainstream, and I got to understand people, and I got to know people, and I got to. Um, I just had an all-access pass, which was wonderful. But that first story in Surfer Magazine, Jim Kempton was the editor then, and Jim published it. And thanks, Jim. It's never been, nothing's ever been so, that's a highlight of my life. I could win an Academy Award, <laughs> and it wouldn't be as big as that. That's cool. That's cool. That's a cool story. Surf journalism right here with Chris. So we're going to go from his first stories to, I believe, his most recent stories right here at Planet X. Chris, you want to tell me more about that? Well, yeah, Gavin, this this latest story is, uh, this, is a, this is something for we'll another, get into that in a another second. moment, <laughs> the real dirt. Yeah. This latest story, Behold What is Greater Than Thyself, it's a story of a young surfer who had an alcoholic father, and he thinks he's killed his father. He finally strikes back to his father, he's 15 years old, lives in Newport Beach, hitchhikes, and ends up in all places Mission Beach. Nice, okay. But then smuggles himself into Baja, and okay. is raised by a Mexican fishing family cool. who teach him values, teach him family, teach him to fish, teach him to take care of himself, and then he realizes his father's still alive and has to go back and face the music. Okay, okay. And go back into, into the uh, he hit so he smuggles himself back into the United States and there's he finds through the story he finds big waves and surf adventure and everything it's a surf story but it's a nice. 
it's a coming of age story. It's kind of like a, a Huckleberry Finn sort of story. Oh, cool. Okay. And I always thought Huck, in Huckleberry Finn, uh, Mark Twain, well, Baja's like the Mississippi River, <laughs> yeah. and this guy Jose okay. is like Jim okay. from Huckleberry Finn. So I, I always, it. I always thought it fit really well, and uh, that's the book. That's the book. We hold you guys. Check it out. Chris Aarons. We'll be right back after this. Planet X TV. All right, Planet X. Gavin back here with Chris, awesome surf journalist of the surf world. I got a few questions, Chris. Since you've been around it, you've been writing about it forever. The surf world. What was the surf scene back in the 70s, let's say the 80s, and even all the way with some 90s in there? What was the surf scene like? The 70s were a transition era, Gavin, as you probably know. It was, shortboards were coming in. It was called the shortboard revolution. Okay. And so we had all these beautiful surfboards. I remember, gosh, a Mike Henson model, sorry Mike, beautiful board <laughs> that we cut down in the garage to make some crude garage made surfboard surfing went soul people were making boards in their garages rad. making boards Super in rad. their front rooms and there was I, my mother always knew what color my surfboard was by what color was on the refrigerator because it was <laughs> resin smeared everywhere we were a mess i remember my mom used to talk in her sleep she woke up one night saying chris you filthy pig and it was it was because of our surfboard making, making surfboards, huh? but we we cut down some of the most valuable parts of history oh yeah to be, we didn't know we you know you're immediate when you're a kid you're not thinking like oh this is going to be valuable someday you're going to go man the swell's <laughs> coming i need a 610 I don't need a 96 I need a 610 so it yeah. was everything was changing the music had changed the styles had changed people had gone from one set of rules to another it was like it was like waking up on another planet do you have a favorite memory about the surf scene in the 70s um Maui 1969 is that count as that's, that's pretty close, that's close. <laughs> it's all blurs together yeah it's not it's, <laughs> As close to the 70s as I can get, but in Maui in 1969, I had made a board in the garage, and okay, cool. And I thought, do, do we need to wait for that? Uh, well, it's sponsored probably by uh... sponsored by American Airlines. We'll be right back after this. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, I'll, I'll throw it back at you. Watch, Here, I got you. Jerry Lopez boards from that era. Um, this is rad. Keeps, I couldn't afford them. This is a great, this is a great conversation. I love what you're saying right now. Oh, this is fun. Yeah, this is I'm cool. Having a, I'm yeah, having a great this is awesome. Time. Thank you. Great, great interview. All right, Planet X. Chris is just getting into what his favorite memory of the 70s slash 1969 was in Maui. Let's hear it. 1969, I'd made a board in my parents' garage, and I thought it was a great board, and I took it to Maui and the surf when I got there was head high and I had a great time on it. I thought it works pretty well. Yeah. But then 1969 turned out to be the year, the storm of the century. The biggest waves that possibly had hit Honolulu Bay ever. Wow. Okay. And I'm there with my garage board okay. and the surf had come up. And back then there were, they, they didn't have um, global warming. Well, they didn't have global warming back then, right? <laughs> well, what they didn't have, they didn't have. Uh, there was no way to know if the surf was up or not. You sure, just, okay, you sure. kind of, you'd kind of guess. The tides, the tide charts. Tide charts, and you'd hear that surf was coming. But I lived on a side of the island that where I could tell in Lahaina, people wouldn't know. So the surf had come in, and it was big. big. And I went to Honolulu Bay. Nice. And I was alone. I had a bo I had this board that I'd made caught about three waves and then broke my board oh, shit. and it was the worst <laughs> feel I mean to be in paradise and not have the tools to enjoy paradise oh, yeah. is like is hell <laughs> yeah. you know so you're you're kind of like I've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden <laughs> and sitting on the cliff my brother showed up and I asked him if he could borrow if I could borrow his board and he goes well you broke your board why should I let you borrow oh, my no. board it was no. before leashes hadn't been invented. Oh, so, okay, yeah. And that beach is, that's some coarse grain sand there. Yeah, it's going to mess it up. That's, yeah. Oh, and it, it broke my board like a twig. Oh, and um, <laughs> I was so 
I had to surf. I just took out the biggest piece I could find on my board. I think it was the nose and tried to kick into waves with it. No I was way. trying to catch waves with this piece of and just ragged Nama Bay. Uh, Honolulu Bay. Honolulu Bay, okay. But it was, um, and later on, um, gosh, I remember Herbie Fletcher, who one of the, has been around Planet X forever. Big name. Was one of the people that really dominated there. And uh, we, at that time, it was Jock Sutherland, Jeff Hackman, a guy named Les Potts from Maui was amazing. Buddy Boy Cahoy. Um, it was a time of, you know, once again, it was a time of change. The guys that I had looked up to as a kid were no longer as relevant. A lot of them had quit surfing. The boards, they didn't relate. It was like suddenly Jimi Hendrix comes in and somebody's playing, <laughs> and Peter, Paul, and Mary, well, where are they? Yeah. Who are they? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear that anymore. I want to hear Hendrix. And yeah, it was sure. really a different scene. Uh -huh. And everything about it was different and in some ways better, in some ways you get nostalgic for But what happened later, it took, it took about seven or eight years for the longboard to come back. There weren't no longboards. They, were, they did not exist. You 70s, the area of just mystic with the longboards. Well, it was about... I moved to Australia in 72 and was gone for two years and when I came back, the surf seemed crowded, and I wanted to surf here, so it was about 75, and um, I thought, oh, a longboard. And I, Donald Takayama was starting to make some of them, a legendary yeah. Donald Takayama. Yeah, oh yeah. And he made a surfboard for me. You know, he actually made one for my friend Pat Beckett, and Steve Moray made one. He used to use the ghost shape for Mike Henson. Okay. He made me an 810. And that was, it was like having your own secret spot. You could go out at shoulder high swamis and surf it by yourself or here at Sunset Cliffs. Yeah, it's nice. Because people simply did not ride long boards. And um, so the 70s to me were a, a really interesting time because it was a time, it was a time of ch change and then change again. One, one of the changes was away from tradition, and the next change was back to tradition. And the 80s carried through with that. And then, I, and then by the time I'm getting older, by the 80s, I'm going, well, okay, longboards. And then in the 90s, uh, the Tudor family, we'd see the Tudor family down at the beach, and their son, Joel, was one of the people that would always hang out and come over and look for a sandwich. And I go, that kid surfs really good for being 14 years old. Yeah. And he understood the old ways. He'd seen the movies. He knew Good. the moves. Good. He had that style. He understood that there was more to it than just running up and hanging ten. And I wouldn't say single-handedly, but of the young guys, nearly single-handedly brought back that movement. Now the guys that brought it back that taught him were Dale Dobson, Donald Takayama, David Nueva, Herbie Fletcher, um, no, I'm leaving people out, and I feel bad. It's like, right. well, it's like you have a party. You can only invite <laughs> 20 people. The 20, yeah, your best friend is the 21st <laughs> one that didn't show up. No, it goes. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. So, do you have a favorite surf era? 70s, 80s, 90s? It, today? What do you think? It's um, God. That is really difficult to say because I. It's. Um, like a favorite song or a favorite movie, you like different things for different reasons. I do, and I like, I like today because now I can ride. A, I've got a board that's as small as five eight that Marty Gilchrist made for me, nice. and I've got a board that's as big as nine foot. Nice. And I have some. I've got some asymmetrical, an asymmetrical that Carl Extra made me. Oh, cool. Which is a fantastic surfboard. Yeah, oh yeah. And Pleasure. very, very advanced. Yeah. So I have a set. Usually I ride seven six to eight foot. Okay. And I use and I don't want to give any false pretenses. I use the five eight as a knee board. Okay. But I have mats and pipo boards and and all these things. That I don't know why we never gave them a thought. Throughout the through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we didn't give these alternative surf craft a thought, and then 
a guy like Richard Kenvin comes along and says, well, look at this Simmons. Yeah. I'm going to make a small one. I'm going to make a mini Simmons. Oh, boy. And it works really well, and that becomes the next big thing. Or Steve Liss here at the Cliffs, yeah. who comes up with the fish. Yeah, it's legendary. And then Fry gets a hold of it, and anything that Fry gets a hold of is going to be a hit. <laughs> yeah. So the surf industry, the eras have definitely changed. Chris is explaining that right now, you guys. I want to know what your opinion is on the future of the surf industry. What's, what do you think the surf's going to be like five, ten years on the actual wave and off the wave? That, uh, to answer that, Gavin, I have to actually go back to the 70s. We were, I remember sitting around at Swami's with Cool. This big wave legend, Ken Bradshaw, he and, he and I were roommates about 1970, before he went to Hawaii. And we were sitting there and we were discussing the idea of being able to actually leave the wave and land an aerial. And okay. it just seemed impossible. <laughs> All right. But cool. so, you know, we could, we, but we were kind of, we could visualize it. Any attempts? Any attempts? I never, the first attempts that I saw were in the mid 70s. Kevin Reed okay. at Steamer Lane, I saw about 75 was the first one I ever saw landed. And then Fun. Christian Fletcher became the aerial guy because mm -hmm. Herbie was always a very innovative surfer with the side slip and had different, different things that he was doing. And Christian picked that up and picked up the 80 and made it into a legitimate move. Yeah. Then now it's just like, if you can't do an aerial, you're not on the tour. Yeah, it's a kickflip on a skateboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, so there's, going back to the 70s to explain the future of the surfboard, you're thinking a lot of aerials, a lot of crazy moves? I don't know. I mean, I would who would have ever thought that the 90s would be dominated by nine sixes? Yeah. Nine six single fins. Single fins, yeah. You know, the, the boards that we cut down. Yeah, cruising. To, yeah, and yeah. it became, some of the most influential surfboards of the time, at least for the recreational surfer. So it, it's, I think, impossible to say. What I think is, I, I talk a lot with Tom Morey and, um, and Carl Ekstrom, good friends of mine, and I can, I can envision a surfboard that's actually computerized that when you, like a fish, you fish, so you watch, you watch fish and they, they extend their fins as they need it. Ah, it's not a rigid okay, fin. So yeah. what if you had a surfboard and you're turning and suddenly the fin starts coming out of the rail and you get more fit, the more pressure you have on your rail, the more fin you have to turn with. What if, you know, your board is more adapting to the wave? Because at this point, I think surfboards, I think surfboards in 20 years, the surfboards we have now are going to look very crude. Yeah. Because there's, be. well, there's still a solid object. Mm -hmm. They're still not molding to the wave. There's still, and there's nothing in nature like that. No bird, a bird's not a solid object. A fish is not a solid object. They're adapting to their condition. And uh, we're stuck with this solid object. Now, that probably a long ways away and I'm sure not the one to make a board like that but <laughs> my point is that somebody's gonna come up with something that's gonna change the game put three fins on a board make write up write a board that's six feet six two at Chopu yeah Damian Hobgood <laughs> and change it. change the world yeah, and that. change your change our perception of what the world can be so all bets are off, and I, I'm not gonna. <laughs> no predictions from me. That's funny. <laughs> so, the on the wave, the technology is probably gonna happen. Now that you've said, you probably just gave somebody ten million dollar idea, and they're gonna come out with this crazy surfboard. So, I hope so. Hey, Chris Aaron's right here on Planet X. Just came up with it first. We patented it. So, what about off the wave? The surf industry. Everybody's coming up. There's so much of a gap. These big corporates are coming in. The small guys are trying to take over. What do you think about the surf industry off the wave? The surf industry, it's, it's basically surf industry is my favorite oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never heard of a surf industry. Yeah. I, I go surfing. And, <laughs> and there, there are, I applaud the people that are responsible that look toward helping to clean up the ocean, toward making surfing better. People that are doing it to simply line their pockets, I won't wear their clothes. 
Gotcha. I gotcha. Chris Aaron's surf industry right here, Planet X. Planet X TV. What's up, Planet X? We're back with Gavin here, chilling at the Internet Sunset Cliff. Chris Aaron's longtime surf journalist of the surf world. I'm gonna ask him a few more questions here today. So, Chris, I need to know. What, what are your favorite surf personalities? You've done a lot of documentary on the actual surfers. You've done a ton of story storytelling, excuse me. Well, out of all of the people that you've had interactions with, you've had a lot of people in, in your history. Any favorite surf personalities and, and who they are and why do you like them so much? Gosh, everyone I ever met. <laughs> yeah. If you ride a surfboard, you're my friend. I like it. But... The, some of the people that I've been fortunate to have known and become close friends with, Skip Fry, such a, I have never heard anybody say anything bad about Skip Fry. He's surfed, probably surfed more linear feet than any person alive. Wow, cool. Humble guy, great guy, never changed, still gets up, can't live without a tide chart. <laughs> at 75 years old, is up in the morning looking at the surf, stoked, yeah. going, just like he always has. And um, another person that became a great friend of mine was Donald Takayama. Cool. And uh, <laughs> Donald and I were, we were kind of polar opposite. At the time that I met him, he was a hard partier, and I was not. But he decided he was going to corrupt me. and. <laughs> there used to be this thing called the Stone Step Surf Contest, and to be in the Stone Step Surf Contest, you had to drink a resin bucket of beer. Oh, okay. And that so, sounds like fun. And so we're out, we're out at this some pub, and and um, I'm going, Donald, slow down, slow down. You're going, you're barely missing cars. And he turned to me and he go, I'm a race car driver, you know. And I go, <laughs> well, okay, but could you? And so the next day he parked perfectly, and the next day I go, Donald, you drove like a maniac last night. And he go, looks at me and he goes, I drove. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> but then went on to win the Stone Step Surf Contest many <laughs> years in a row. A fantastic surfer, a great craftsman, and. Um, if you ask anyone about Donald Takayama, Devin Howard, uh, Joel Tudor, Nat Young, he influenced so many people and w always with such kindness. And when I met Donald, I, was, I had never written a surf story. He had no reason to be a friend of mine, except that he was just a good and generous guy. He made me a surfboard, he gave me a surfboard, he knew I didn't have any money, and was just, a, just the best guy. And Mr. Aloha had so much care and love in his heart and um, probably built some of the finest surfboards ever. Those, those two and Carl Ekstrom. Carl Ekstrom is a very good friend of mine and again a humble guy, genius, that came up with the asymmetrical in 1964. Killed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Killed it. And it's still going. Ryan Birch, I think, is, is another one. Ryan Birch is somebody that you look at and go, you are just on, you're on planet X. You're, nice. you're in your own world. He doesn't think like anybody else. And um, <laughs> Brad Gerlach, Rob Machado, Joel Tudor. I've been blessed to know a lot of great people. Yeah, it sounds like you've you've had your fair share of love from those surfers, so, which is real cool to hear. Now, out of all of those surfers and, and all the journalism that you have done in the writing, is there a certain story that kind of stands out? Uh, if you can give us a quick a quick little fun story of anybody. There was a time, there was the first surf story that I ever wrote, and I called it the day we became real surfers, and my brother and okay. I, <laughs> there were these these guys in our neighborhood, and they were kind of... This, they said this one guy had a sawed-off shotgun in his car. This was oh, 1963, man. and so they came up to our they came to our house, and these guys were thugs. Okay. They weren't posers. They were the real thing. Hardcore. And this guy had a lowered Woody. Whoa. And he was a gnarly, gangster. gnarly gangster. Yeah. But he had a surfboard. He had a big <laughs> Greg Knoll surfboard that he sometimes would, he would throw it off the cliff at at Swami's and and go down and pick up his board and just scare everybody but so <laughs> he took us to he took us to Lanata Bay back when the Dominator was broken into at Lanata Bay and 
my brother and I are going, gosh, we're at Lenata. And they made my brother, who was this cute little kid, 12 years old, they made him go and leech money from, from people to get money. They go, tell, go tell these people you need a dime for gas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, call mom. Yeah. <laughs> and so they'd give him $5, and <clears throat> they bought wine with the money and yeah. proceeded to get drunk and torture us further. But um, they told my mom that they were going to take us to church Sunday, you know, and she believed them. Okay. Nice button-down <laughs> collar shirt, here's a, the thug of L.A. is <laughs> taking us surfing. So we get there, and they made us go in the water. It was cold. We didn't want to go out. And they said, no, you guys are going out. You guys are going to surf. And we saw that most of those guys couldn't even surf. Huh. And we were kind of okay. But... Um, so we paddled out, and <laughs> they started throwing rocks at us. They made us go to the point, which was very scary to us. I mean, it wasn't huge, but it was pretty big. And um, we caught waves, and we were very proud of ourselves, and they were proud of us. Nice. They forced us into this situation, and then we got to ride in the front seat instead of underneath the boards in the back. And, okay, okay. And, um, they were kind of like, they were really, they were always really cool to us after that. That's super rad. Cool stories. Chris Aarons, Planet X. We'll be right back after this. Planet X TV. What's happening to Planet X? Gavin back here chilling at the end of Sunset Cliffs with my main man Chris, longtime surf journalist. I'm going to talk about magazine uh, for a second. Uh, Risen Magazine. So what I want to know is how did you get involved? What are you currently doing for them? And do you have any favorite celebrities? Oh, that's a... <laughs> you ask those questions, Gavin. I got you, I got you. You do. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed interviewing uh, Juliette Lewis. She was, she was a lot of fun. And uh, I enjoyed uh, Anthony Kiedis as an interview and um, Billy Corgan. But there were just... It was an amazing time because we didn't even... We had, this, we had an idea to do a magazine and no money we were and so we started doing these we started putting this thing together in scott hancock's garage and it became uh and alan kamisa who's a friend of uh, i don't want to get too involved here Whatever but you want. but he's a friend he's a friend of don's and alan said well i'll pay for the first magazine Nice. And then we, we started getting calls, but our, our idea was to interview celebrities on their spirituality. Okay. So I got a call from Gary Busey. I got a call from Alice Cooper. Nice. Got a call from <laughs> Ziggy Marley, Jack Johnson. Well, we want to be in the magazine. We go, what? what? How did you even know there was a magazine? I've got... And so we went to uh, our first interview. Gary Busey, what a trial by fire. Yeah. So we get there and he goes, walks to the door and goes, shh, and uh, walks away. And we're going like, uh, you know, we go in, what are we supposed to do? So I says, okay, we're going in. So we walk in and um, he would say to me, he'd say, I had a tape recorder and he'd go, stop the tape, you're using earth words. Okay. Earth words earth words whoa what? so <laughs> I'm, you know being Glad from there. from this planet those are the only ones that i know <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, gary Busey's from another time zone i think and <laughs> amazing guy but he was and finally i just got to the point where i said i got fr frustrated and i said oh i had questions in my hand and i said i wadded him up and put him on the ground i said well what do you want to talk about and he goes well i'm glad you finally asked and i realized right, okay I realized then, Gavin, that was the best question I'd asked to that point. What do you want to talk about? Okay. Oh, really? You want to? He liked that. And then he became, he started playing us music and said, cool. you guys stick around. We, I love, uh, and then he told me how when he was dead, he was uh, 18 inches tall and a quarter inch wide. Okay. And uh, who am I to argue? <laughs> but uh, that was the beginning of a, uh, seven years of uh, a great run and I really enjoyed the interviews enjoyed um, sitting down with Ozzy Osbourne so rad Christian Hasoy, Tony Hawk 
Super cool. Um, Hillary Swank. Hillary Swank called me. I, I'd called her, and then she called back, and she said, "Hi, Chris. This is Hillary Swank." And I, I was nervous. I didn't know what to say, so I said, <laughs> paused, and I said, "Who gave you my number?" Like I'm mad at her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then she thought that was funny, and then yeah. we, then we had a great, we had a great conversation. That's funny. Afterwards. <laughs> so the film, uh, film scripture. You've done a lot of, uh, of writing in a time. Tell me about some film that you've done. Not too much. I did a little film with a guy named Steve Cleveland who went on to do some surf films, but that was the first thing I did. And it was a little movie called On Safari to Stay about the revival of longboarding. And it was Wingnut was in it, and Joel, it introduced Joel Tudor and Wingnut to the surfing public. And uh, the, other, the other one that I did was a film called Dope, Death or Prison Eventually. And it's the story of the rise, fall, and redemption of four of the world's top skateboarders, Jay Adams. Christian Hasoy, Dennis Martinez, and Bruce Logan. And how two of them ended up on meth living beneath a bridge and two of them ended up in prison on heroin. Wow. Dennis ended up playing Russian roulette. He was had been the world he had been a world champion skateboarder, just lives not far from here. Would play he was sixteen years on the needle on meth. Wow. And just ruined his life playing Russian roulette for fun to get the buzz he used to get from skateboarding. Now he runs a oh rehab center in Spring Valley okay. for men coming out of prison. So we did a movie called Dope, Death or Prison Eventually. Yeah. And it's about it's about skateboarding. It's a hardcore skate film, but it's kind of like what happened after Dogtown. Yeah, that's a cool story. And Jay Adams became a great friend and and um, it was really great getting to know him as a surfer skater. That's a rad story. So, Chris, uh, I know we have Behold, you guys, everybody, go check it out. But uh, what's in the future for Chris? What, what do you see, uh, what's going on with you uh, in the near? Well, I've got a script out. It's called East of Angel Town, based on my book, Twilight in the City of Angels. And that is something I'm shopping right now. And it's a story. It's a story of a. It's basic. It's loosely based upon my grandfather. My grandfather, Jose de la Luz Santiago, was drunk on tequila and he passed out between the railroad ties. It was raining. The train ran him over and creased his forehead, but he didn't kill him. So, it, but it left him with a, a joyous disposition because he actually had a railroad lobotomy. Oh, in a sense, yeah. left with a joyous disposition, a belief in Jose Cuervo Tequila, the Union Pacific Railroad, and Our Lady of Guadalupe. So he had a little, he had a statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a bottle of tequila, and a little toy train set up at his altar at his house. And he would talk about how he had helped build the red cars when he was. He gives the history of Mexican American Los Angeles. He tells this story to his grandson through the and for the rest of cool. its fiction. Cool. He, but he did he married an Apache Indian woman who never spoke English, never cut her hair, would cast spells on us kids and <laughs> 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 But he was a, a fascinating character in, in and of himself, but from there it goes into a it goes into a bigger story and we're I've been mean, Danny Trejo who grew up near uh, Chavez Ravine. It talks about Chavez Ravine, which is now Dodger Stadium, how that was a community, a thriving community yep. of hundreds of people, and it was eminent domain and turned into a baseball park. But uh, Danny Trail used to watch that when he was a, a young man, and we're hoping to have Danny Trail play the lead. That'd be rad. And I know he's going to love the story, Danny. Danny, get it. Get on it, Danny. Get on it. All right, you guys, that's Chris Aarons, legendary surf journalist. You guys, I really appreciate you coming out. Thank you so much, Gavin. Thanks, Planet X. We'll see you guys soon right here on Planet X. Planet X TV. All right, Planet X, back here with Gavin and Chris. So, writer, author, journalist, the surf world, you have to look at his report card. Would you like to say anything before we, we show them your report card? Well, I used to write, I wrote stories from the time I could remember, made them up, told them, wrote parodies, but 
I never got a good grade at it because your grade for writing was how good your penmanship was, if you spelled everything correctly, nobody seemed to care. I grew up in a town called Montebello, St. Benedict's School. My, my teacher was uh, Sister Mary Ignatius. Serious. Oh, she she was a serious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sister Mary with the ruler. Ignatius. Blood, yeah. Oh yeah. I've <laughs> yeah. got the scars to prove that I was in that school, and um, she didn't have a great appreciation for my writing apparently. <laughs> no, I guess not. <laughs> so, everybody, uh, Planet X here. So Chris has his report card from sixth grade. Sixth grade. Sixth grade, and he's a very good student. But there's one subject that he excels at now that apparently he did not excel back then. And Planet X, uh, we have to show you, Chris got all Fs in writing. He didn't get one A, C, D, or B. It was just all Fs. So don't let your teacher judge you on how you can write because Chris will show you and tell you that that's, that's not always the best way to do it. Well, I... Amazingly, this should be encouraging. <laughs> yeah. This is some, very encouraging. Somebody like me, or some kid who goes, you know, you'll never. I mean, this, the world of successful people, it's replete with people hearing, you'll never do that. Michael Jordan story. Yeah. Or you'll, you know, get out of music. Marlon Brando was told by his dad, don't go into acting. Yep. Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Planet X, you see the Fs, let it, Chris, encourage you, be a writer, do your thing, don't always let teachers judge you, he's a story, right here, Chris on Planet X, see you guys soon. Planet X TV. All right, Planet X, I'm Gavin Fleming, and unfortunately, that's it for this week, Chris Aarons, thanks for coming in, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gavin, been a pleasure. We'll see you guys next time, right here on Planet X.